Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Giles Leeming from Mossy UK. Um, and just going to be, uh, first of all, thanking uh, both London Sports Orthopaedics and HCA um, for allowing us to um, host this event here. Um, we're here at London Bridge Hospital. Um, can I just check that everyone can hear? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so, yes, we're here at London Bridge uh, Hospital. Um, and I'd like to, to sort of start this evening um, with, first of all, a few uh, little rules, uh, first of all, and housekeeping information. Uh, I'm just going to pop over to my colleague, Pete. Um, so, first of all, um, this is a webinar, but we also have uh, a live audience as well. So, we have, have about 20 to 30 people here as well. So, we'll also uh, see some heads and there will be some questions in here. So, if there are any questions in here, what we'll do is we will ask um, the, the speaker to um, just repeat that question so for the people on the webinar um, they can get that. Um, and first of all, to introduce the speakers, we have Mr. Ian McDermott, uh, an orthopedic uh, knee surgeon who's based here at the London Bridge Hospital as part of uh, London Sports Orthopedics, and also Cal Palmer, um, who specializes in uh, conservative management of, of osteoarthritis. Um, also myself uh, and Mike Unger um, will be speaking a little bit about unicompartmental osteoarthritis and the role of physiotherapy and bracing. So, if you want to communicate with us, um, any questions that you have, type them through the Q&A function. Um, and also, if a question doesn't get answered, uh, we'll come back to it at the end. Each speaker will also go to the, uh, to the laptop after they've had their uh, talk and will also ask any questions, uh, answer any questions that are on there as well. Um, you can also use the chat function. So one of our, one of our team is on there and is monitoring that. Um, so you can ask any questions as we go along. It is also being recorded as well. So um, it actually means that you can come back to this later. Um, for the purposes of the CPD, um, it's important that you stay on for the whole duration of the webinar um, in order to receive the, the, the one and a half uh, hours of, uh, of CPD uh, hours. There is a follow-up questionnaire. We do really appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, and we can also send out e-certificates as well. Okay. Um, so I'd like to, to move over uh, to Mr. McDermott um, and just to uh, pass over to him. With regards to uh, his talk, uh, he's just coming around now. And uh, thank you very much. Right, thank you, Giles. Um, thank you to the guys from OSA. There's a lot of tech going on here right now. Uh, if it works, I think it's amazing, like a miracle. Um, it's making me feel a little bit old, actually. I think this interwebby thing is really clever. The, I was flattered and pleased to be asked to speak first meeting. I thought that means I'm the most important one. And then they said, right, will you do a really quick introduction? All right, and you're just the warm-up act. And actually, we want you to talk about why surgery is not good. So, okay. By introduction, apologies. This is the group that I work in, London Sports Orthopaedics. We're based in the middle of the city. It's a group of orthopaedic surgeons covering all the different subspecialties. And we're lucky enough to have Cal, who's our sports physician. We've got a pain specialist. We've got a rheumatologist as well. Um, we're based right in the city and we operate here at London Bridge Hospital and London Bridge is the best hospital, best private hospital in the entire country. And you can get away with saying that because all the people who are on the webinar are not here to complain. So we're going to talk about arthritis and specifically for me, I'm just interested in the knee, I don't do anything but the knee, just purely knees. So what is arthritis? Is it common? What's a knee replacement? And what are the negatives of knee replacement surgery and how do we actually delay knee replacement surgery and why? And then finally, what is the role of braces? Are they important? Do we use them? Well, we'll show you. Everybody thinks they know what knee arthritis is. Um, I'm not sure I do. I spend my whole half my life dealing with it. And if somebody says to me, somebody's got knee arthritis, it doesn't really tell me anything. It's just like saying, I've got a car. Well, what car? Is it a four by four, a sports car, a young car, an old car, electric car, whatever? Uh, it just doesn't tell me anywhere near enough. So lumping everybody together into this kind of homogenous diagnosis of knee arthritis doesn't help me at all in terms of my diagnosis and potential treatment plan. 
So likewise, when you look at knee x-rays, you may say the, knee, uh, the x-ray on the left is normal, the x-ray on the right shows an obviously arthritic knee with severe medial unicompartmental osteoarthritis. Um, I would very much hesitate to say whether the, the knee on the left is normal or abnormal. And just because there's a normal-ish looking x-ray, I don't think that tells you anywhere near the full story. But is it common? Yeah, it's ridiculously common. So 5% of people over the age of 25 to 45, 15% over 45, but 40% of people over the age of 60 have got radiographic evidence of knee OA. That's huge. Doesn't mean they've all got pain, as you well know, but it means they've got radiographic evidence. So why do we see oste um, osteoarthritis? And I'm really talking about just specifically osteoarthritis, not rheumatoid arthritis. And we brought it, broadly divide it into primary or secondary. Primary is predominantly genetic. Um, it, there is a strong genetic element to it. Secondary means there's something else that's caused it. And there's a long list of different reasons. Maybe post-traumatic, and there's a few papers being published just recently really emphasizing the massive increase in osteoarthritis in the future if you suffer a sports injury when you're young. Post-infective, if you end up with a septic arthritis, it's not just the fact that it makes you very, very ill, um, and it's not just the systemic effects, and it's not just the short or mid-term treatment you want to worry about, it's the long-term damage and the long-term effects of the joint. Malalignment, varus valgus, a lot of that can be constitutional, just the shape of you. Okay, and hand in hand with that malalignment concept is patella tracking. Okay, patella tracking, mal tracking, and also abnormal patellofemoral morphology like patella or patellofemoral dysplasia it has a very, very strong correlation with future patellofemoral arthritis. And then you've got the slightly more um, the slightly more rare entities like osteochondritis dissecans, which happens in younger people. Well, that is a precursor to a whole long history of future problems in that young person's knee. And what are the effects? Well, we know this, right? This is obvious. Pain, reduced function, stiffness, but it leads on to other things. It affects people's lives in a big way. Loss of earnings, reduction in quality of life, um, increased weight. People say if you can't exercise, then you put on weight. I mean, I always wonder what component of the donuts have got to do with that as well. Um, I think it might be more than just they can't exercise. But if you can't exercise, your metabolic rate slows down and anything you eat will um, help you put on weight, unfortunately. And if you end up not exercising, if you end up immobile, then you're going to decrease not just your quality of life, but also the length, your life expectancy as well. So is it relevant? Yeah, kind of. A huge burden to the individual and also a huge burden to society billions, like literally billions of pounds are spent per year in the UK because of knee arthritis. So it's easy, isn't it? The answer is do a knee replacement. Job done. Thank you very much. End of my talk. Um, not quite. What is a knee replacement? Uh, still surprises me, but lots of patients think that we replace the whole joint. We take it out, a massive lump of bone, and we put in a great joint, like some kind of universal joint with hinges. We don't, it's a resurfacing procedure. So what we do is we shave the surface of the femur, you shave the surface of the tibia, you put on a metal surface and cement it in place. There are some cemented prostheses, generally most are cemented, and then plastic washes in between the two. Um, it's a really fun operation for me. I don't think anybody who's ever had a knee replacement would ever describe it as fun from their perspective. It is a big operation. And you open up the whole knee. So it's not just the bone you're shaving, you've got to get in there. So you've got to cut through everything at the front of the knee. You've got to cut through the quad tendon. You've got to cut round the medial retinaculum. You've got to dislocate the patella. It's pretty brutal. So it's not to be underestimated. It's a nasty thing to do to somebody. So in terms of survivorship, all knee replacements in the UK are, or certainly should be, registered on the National Joint Register. And it's a fantastic resource, and they gather a huge amount of data. And now, currently, the latest figures, there's over a million knee replacements registered on the NJR, which is huge. What the NJR allows us to do is to look at outcomes, and look at outcomes over the long term with big numbers, and it gives a really, really good, clear picture of potential problems that may be arising with a particular prosthesis, 
It's a good way of flagging up outliers in terms of surgeons. Uh, it's a good way of looking at outcomes in terms of survivorship. So when you ask a patient, or the patients normally ask, how long does a knee replacement last? And very often the patient themselves say, oh, well, knee replacement only lasts 10 years, doesn't it? Um, I don't know who it was who actually first came out with that statement, but I can throttle them, but it's wrong. If you look at the data, if you look at the survivorship curves, around about 95% of knees are still working fine after, after 10 years. So only 5% have failed after 10 years, and about 80% are working fine after 20 years. So they don't just last 10 years. But there is a problem here because the, the age group of people having knee replacements is reducing. People are doing more speed, sport, people are smashing their knees up, people are, have got higher expectations. As the surgery gets better, the threshold for doing the surgery lowers. Also, people are living longer. So the number of knee replacements is going up exponentially. That's not true, it's not exponentially, it's going up significantly. Um, the estimate was that between about 2010 to 2030, we're going to see an increase in the number of knee replacements by 500%, which is catastrophically huge. And the effect of age is very relevant. It really does have a big impact. If you do a knee replacement in somebody who's only, sorry, who's in their 70s, there's only a 10% risk of a revision within that patient's lifetime, a 90% chance that the prosthesis will outlast the patient. If you do a knee replacement in somebody who's in their 50s, there's a 50% chance of it failing within their lifetime and them needing a revision. Okay. So age makes a very, very big difference. In terms of outcomes, well, we talk about prosthetic survivorship, and I think personally that's wrong. These, these graphs are very, very useful, but they're not the full picture. So if you had a knee replacement and it lasted a hundred years, then you'd say that's a success. But what if your knee replacement caused you agony? You hated it. You're in pain, you're stiff, you have poor function. You are bitterly unhappy with your, your knee replacement. Well, is it the, the fact that it lasts 10, 20, 30, 40 years, is that good or bad? So prosthetic survivorship is by no means the whole picture. Certainly not from the patient's perspective and therefore not from ours. It's all about patient satisfaction. And how do we measure satisfaction? Well, with PROMS, patient reported outcome measures. So we ask patients, how's your knee feeling? Things like the Oxford Knee Score, um, Pain Vast Score, a really good score is called the Forgotten Joint Score, um, EQ 5D, Quality of Life Scores. We've got lots of different scoring systems. And overall, depending on which papers you read and what studies you look at, um, the patient satisfaction rate with a standard knee replacement is somewhere between about 80 to 85%, depending on. On, on which paper. So that's pretty good, 80 to 85%. Well, actually it's not. That means that 15 to 20% of people are not happy. And if you think that about 90,000 knee replacements are being done per year in the UK, then 15% of 90,000 is a big number. So it's a lot of people who are out there who are very unhappy. And people who are unhappy with something um, they tell 10 people. If you're happy, you tell two. If you're unhappy, you tell 10. This is what TripAdvisor is about. You can't tell the difference between five, out, you know, five stars because everybody's got five stars until you see the one star and you go, oh, they must be bad. So that's why knee replacement, quite understandably, has got a bit of a reputation. And what are the actual negatives? Well, it's a big op. It's a painful op. It's much more painful than a hip replacement. You require lots of time off work. If you're doing a manual job, you're going to be off for at least three months, at least. Very slow, very difficult rehab. Um, I guess most of the people in the audience are physiotherapists, so you know better than anyone, apart from someone who's actually had it done, just how tough the rehab is. And the risks. The risks are low, but low risk does not mean no risk. There's a small risk of infection, less than 1%. The risk of neurovascular damage, thankfully tiny. A small but definitely not low risk of DVT, so we give blood thinners, and blood thinners cause bleeding, bruising, swelling, so they've got their own negatives. So the, these risks um, have to be taken extremely seriously. And also, when you're consenting a patient for surgery, the thing to emphasize is satisfaction is not guaranteed, 
and proper patient consent requires uh, the patient to be fully informed. So we have to explain all of this to the patients in clinic. And then you've got the final problem of wear and tear, and the wear and tear and the failure ending up with revision. Well, what's the problem with a revision? Just redo it, not so. A revision knee replacement is twice as big as a primary, twice as difficult, double the complication rate, much slower recovery, poorer outcomes, and poorer outcomes in terms of survivorship as well. So a revision is twice as bad as a primary. So we should be doing everything we can reasonably to avoid patients having to be subjected to revision knee surgery. So that then leads on to the question about when, or when do you go ahead with a knee replacement? And you can have algorithms and people publish algorithms and guidelines. Um, I hate protocols. Guidelines are fun. And if you don't know what you're doing, they're quite useful. Um, but if you know what you're doing, the last thing you need is a protocol. You know, protocols for medical students and student physios who want to learn who've got no experience. It's very, very simple. When do you have a knee replacement? Well, when the time is right. Simple as that. It's not, I don't want a tick box. I don't want a formula. I don't want an algorithm. I don't want a computer. It's just when the time is right for that individual patient. And that's based on how much does it hurt them? How much does it affect their function? How much does it bother them? I mean, there's plenty of people out there with horrible looking knees who are coping perfectly fine. But also, have they tried appropriate alternatives? And quite often, I've heard patients in clinics say, I say, have you, have you taken any painkillers and anti-inflammatories? Oh no, I don't like foreign stuff inside me. That was a northern accent or something, I don't know. Northerners. Um, and um, am I right in thinking that, that 50 people have just blinked off? <laughs> so, um, they say, I don't like foreign stuff inside me. And I think, why well, have you seen a knee replacement? Uh, have you actually, have you guys actually felt a knee replacement? You picked one up. It's really big, clunky, heavy metal. So I always direct patients to this page on our website. And I think you guys are going to get our presentation and hope you'll be able to just click on that. And I've written a whole long article about when is the right time to go ahead with a knee replacement. And every single patient who might be having a knee replacement, I email them this link along with other advice sheets. I just ask them to re read the article. So the question is, how do you delay a knee replacement? Well, we're gonna fly through this now because there's loads of stuff that I can do. But the difference for me between conservative management and in ending up doing a fully blown knee replacement is absolutely massive. Right? And there's a mass of different options available. So. First of all, have avoided knee replacement by having good genetics. Well, you can't influence that. That's just how it is. But don't pound your knees. I mean, people come to clinic and say, I've done 100 marathons, my knee hurts. And it's like, no, nah, you don't say. Right? People play rugby and you've got, no, stupid game, isn't it, Cal? Crazy. So you've got 20 stone blokes running 10 second 100 meters crashing into each other with another 20 stone bloke running at the same speed the other way and they wonder why they get hurt it's horrific it's the best game in the world and the worst game in the world so conservative treatments have you been through the various conservative treatments and if not then why not do you even know they exist I mean, have you had the right guidance um loads of times i've had people say oh i've done physio it doesn't work I said, well, what physio have you done? They said, well, I went to the NHS and they gave me these sheets of paper, these lie diagrams, these, and they told me to do these exercises, and I've done it. I'm like, whoa, so you haven't met some of the physios that I know. So Cal's going to talk about conservative management because that's his remit. And I refer a lot of patients to Cal on a regular, Cal's just grinning at me. Yeah, and I do. Cal's an integral part of my practice because I can't provide the full range of treatments for my patients on something that I'm not a specialist in. And Cal specializes in the non-surgical treatment options. Um, deal with issues early, right? So a lot of people say, oh, don't, do, you know, don't have an operation until it's a very last resort. And um, I did have an osteopath once who brought his son in, and I hope he's not listening on the webinar because he'll know who he is. And um, his son had a locked knee and been locked for about four months. 
And I said, well, why didn't you bring him sooner? Because now it's irretrievable. He's going to lose his meniscus now. There's no way that's going to be reducible and repairable. If you'd have brought it in sooner, it might have been. And he said, well, you know, um, the best surgery is no surgery. I was like, whoa, okay. And I said, well, what about cancer? And he went, mm, like that. It's a bit of a harsh thing to say, but do you get the analogy? If you need surgery, you need it. And if you leave a problem, it's like, it's like the best analogy in for cars is tires. If your tires are wearing thin and they're becoming threadbare, you don't just carry on driving until you have a blowout on the motorway. You say, oh, the, the best tires are blown out tire. You know, it's like, no, all right. It's a careful balance. So massive cause of future arthritis, meniscal tears and meniscal loss, meniscectomy. Right? So for me, what's the opposite of meniscectomy? Well, it's meniscal repair. That's meniscal repair being done. And I repair somewhere between about 25% to a third of the patients that I see with a meniscal tear. I do a lot more than normal because it's one of my specialist interests. And also I work in the city, so I've got a young patient cohort. But whenever you possibly can, you should repair the meniscus. And if you do a meniscal repair, the success rate for it healing is about 90%. Okay, it's fiddly, it's much harder surgery, much, much slower rehab on cr uh, crutches and a knee brace for the first six weeks before they really get going. But 90% probability of keeping your meniscus. So whenever you can do a meniscal repair, you should do a meniscal repair if it looks appropriate. And if you lose your meniscus, well then it's not irretrievable because you can actually replace the meniscus. So that picture at the top is a medial meniscus missing from a medial compartment, and underneath is a new meniscus. It's a meniscal allograft, so it's called meniscal allograft transplantation. Difficult, complex surgery, but completely doable. I've done about 100 so far. Um, there's not many of us in the UK who actually do this, but if you've got a specialist interest, then at least it's an option that's available. If you've got unstable articular cartilage, the best analogy I can give you on that is it's like flaky paint in a rusty gate. And every time you put your finger over it, you crack off more bits and you flake off more, more paint. But that's a little bit like articular cartilage. If you've got unstable articular cartilage in your joint, you can smooth it off and you can stabilize it with a radiofrequency probe. It's called radiofrequency covalation chondroplasty. Catchy title. And it's really easy, it's really quick, it's really easy. It's done, it's done via an arthroscopy, it's not complicated. If you've got missing cartilage, you've got a patch of articular cartilage missing. We're not talking about widespread fully bone arthritis, we're talking about focal cartilage defects. Well then replace it. That's a 29 year old girl who had a massive patch of cartilage missing on her medial femoral condyle. She had other issues going on at the same time and she needed patella surgery as well which is why I did a full arthrotomy instead of just a mini arthrotomy or arthroscopy. But that's her having a chondrotissue articular cartilage graft. Right? Do you really want me to do a partial knee replacement in a 29-year-old girl? No. If you've got a wobbly knee, stabilize it. Everybody knows that if you tear your ACL, you, um, you don't necessarily have to have an ACL reconstruction, but there are consequences. The, the more wobbly the knee is, the more unstable it is, the more times it gives way, the more damage you cause to all the other structures in the knee, particularly developing meniscal tears. And we see very, very regularly people coming into clinic with an old ACL injury or an old PCL injury. And they come because they've developed meniscal tears and articular cartilage damage. And it's secondary to an old ACL injury. If you know the literature, then you'll be able to quote straight back at me the fact that there's a lack of evidence proving that ACL reconstruction actually reduces the long-term risk of osteoarthritis. But what it does do is it drastically reduces the risk of meniscal tears. And we know that meniscal tears um, more end up being trimmed than repaired. And we know that meniscal loss causes arthritis. So there's a direct logical correlation, but there's just a lack of evidence in the literature. And again, it's horses for courses. If a 60, 70, 80 year old person who's, who's non-active, non-sporty tears their ACL, you're probably not going to do an ACL reconstruction, are you? But if a young sportsman does or a kid does, then you absolutely should. So torn ACL, reconstruct it, protect not just the stability, but protect the whole knee. If you've got maltracking, maltracking eventually leads to patellofemoral arthritis. There's lots and lots and lots that you, you guys um, can do to work on patellofemoral tracking. 
But there's also quite a lot we could do surgically as well. You can actually realign a patella very effectively surgically. It's just a lot more invasive and a lot nastier than what you guys do. Ferrous valgus. Well, you can do an osteotomy. You can cut the bone, you can realign it, fix it with a plate, and you can straighten it and offload the damaged compartment and put the weight onto the other compartment. It's a really good operation. It's been around for decades and decades and decades, osteotomy surgery. Fed out a favourite, it's becoming more popular again recently. But an osteotomy, you're breaking somebody's leg. Effectively, you're breaking their leg and resetting it, to put it bluntly. It's not very nice. Then you've got custom-made focal resurfacing implants, like the epicelar implant. So instead of doing a full knee replacement, if somebody's not right for cartilage grafting, maybe they're a bit older, and you've got a full thickness defect and you want to do an operation that's quick, easy and mobilise them fast, you can do a mini, mini partial knee replacement. It's called an epicelar. They're fantastic. Then you've got partial knee replacement. So you've got a medial unicompartmental, a lateral unicompartmental, or you've got patellofemoral partial, so a patellofemoral arthroplasty. All of them smaller than a total, leave more than knee in place, feels more like a normal knee much higher patient satisfaction rates and better function than a total knee replacement. But the negative is, if you do a partial in the wrong patient, if they progress to arthritis in their other compartments, then you might end up having to convert the partial to a total, which is a big negative. So you have to, so patient selection is key. And then you've got total knee replacement. And my personal opinion, backed up by the evidence that's coming out increasingly from America, is that custom-made knee replacements are the best in terms of patient satisfaction. Not much debate. If you don't believe it, it means you've not read the literature. So I use custom made knee replacements from conformists. And evidence, okay, it's very well to, it's all well to make statements, bold statements, but you have to come up with proof and to back up your evidence. And the evidence is there. The best study that I like to quote is by Kat Hagen. And it showed that with a standard off the shelf prosthesis, patient satisfaction rate in his patient cohort was only 75%. With a custom made knee, 95%, a massive, massive decrease in unhappy patients. So, do you want a knee replacement? Easy, it's an equation. You balance out the risks versus the benefits. If I told you that I had a knee replacement, I had a special operation that was non invasive, zero risk, it cost about 500 quid, it nearly always works, or to some extent, normally works, certainly. It reduces pain, it improves function, and it delays or can it even potentially avoid surgery. Then that's somewhat better than the previous slides. Yeah? Well, what knee replacement, what prosthesis does that? Well, not a prosthesis, it's more of a um, orthotic. So for me, an offloading brace ticks all of those previous boxes. And when you show the patient this as an option, compared to slashing their knee open, cutting through quite a lot of important stuff, sawing their bone, and cementing big lumps of metal on, why would you not want to dry this? This is an osteotomy, right? Guide pin, cutting through the bone, cranking it open, creating a wedge, filling the wedge with bone graft, putting on a metal plate with screws. As I said before, it is great fun for me. Um, it's not a great operation. And if you compare that to this, then it really does emphasize that it would be pretty much criminal not to at least offer the option of, a, of an offloading brace to somebody who presents with unicompartmental arthritis. So I'm going to hand over to Cal. Cal's now going to talk more about the conservative treatment options before we then go on to the whole concept of bracing. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Hi. Hi, everyone and everyone listening. Um, so I want to talk about conservative management of knee osteoarthritis and I thought I'd start with what, what I tell patients, and I'm going to reference the NICE guidelines as well, um, because it's, they're pretty good guidelines, but some of it I don't quite agree with. So when I, when I see a patient and I say the word arthritis, 
some of them look at me in horror because they got no idea what it means. They just think that they're going to need some sort of joint replacement or they've got rheumatoid arthritis or there's something really horrible going on. So what I tell them is, you know, it's a clinical syndrome, it's joint pain, reduced function, reduced quality of life. That is arthritis for the layman. Um, in terms of pathology, you know, some of them ask, well, what, what, is it, what does it actually do? Or what is it? It's loss of cartilage, the bone remodels, and then there's associated inflammation. And very, very mild arthritis, the body will repair itself. But when it doesn't repair itself, that's called joint failure. And then you get symptomatic osteoarthritis. So I'll tell the patients, you're probably developing this for a long time. The joint isn't coping, so then your joint's failing. Um, and then you get a little bit of loss of cartilage, the bone's remodeling a bit, and you get some inflammation. That's what we can see on x-rays and scans. Um, the commonest joints affected is the hip and knee, but also the small joints of the hand. Um, and then pain is quite a funny thing. So I see some horrendous looking x-rays and the patients are fine. Or not fine, but not, not as much pain as I think they should be in. And I see some very you know, good looking x-rays and the patients have a lot of pain. So there's a lot of biosocial uh, issues going on. So diagnosing osteoarthritis, if you look at the NICE guidelines, they say if you're age over 45 and you've got activity related joint pain and no morning stiffness greater than 30 minutes, that's a diagnosis of osteoarthritis. You don't need an x-ray. Me being a specialist in knee as well, we rely on imaging. We get a bit nervous about not doing any imaging because we don't want to miss things like gout, rheumatoid arthritis, septic arthritis, malignancy. In the general practice setting and more of the community setting, that they are the guidelines. You know, you don't need to do any imaging. Um, I will tend to do at the minimum is an x-ray with specific views, uh, depending on uh, the patient, maybe some blood tests, maybe taking a bit of fluid out of the joint and analyzing that. And this is why I love working with physiotherapists because they have a holistic approach. And I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, but um, I haven't got time to go through all of this. It's just talking about well-being of the patient. So looking at the mood, the sleep, diet, et cetera, et cetera. I will probably only see a patient uh, two or three times uh, throughout the whole diagnostic pathway and treatment pathway. I think as physiotherapists, you tend to see them a bit more often, you get to know them, and then you can talk to them a bit more about you know, their job, their sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the good physiotherapists would you know, tend to talk to them uh, sort of slightly holistically, which is what I like. And again, this is the NICE guidelines. The NICE guidelines mention this. You should, you know, we should be asking about this. We haven't got time to, but um, they are the guidelines. And then when I see a patient, there's certain things I like to do. Uh, one is to give them information, education. So I'd send them a couple of web links. One is, these are freely available. One is Patient UK, which is a government website. And you just type in osteoarthritis and it gives you a layman's explanation of osteoarthritis. Um, what you should do, kind of investigations and treatment. And then there's this odd website versus osteoarthritis, which used to be Arthritis UK. Again, it's like government thing. And again, gives you a very good outline of osteoarthritis for the patient. So I give them these two links by email and they can look at that in their own time. And then the patient has to buy into um, their self-management because they have, to, they have to change, particularly when it comes to exercise and weight loss. So these are the two core factors in osteoarthritis that they can change. And then you have this thing called thermotherapy, cold packs, and then uh, capsicane, which is a, it's almost like a heat pack. So the non-pharmacological management, uh, weight loss, and physical therapy. So strengthening and flexibility. Uh, these are from NICE guidelines. They, they mentioned that they are the two core things that patients should do in the non-pharmacological management of osteoarthritis. Uh, you have acupuncture, which is not recommended, and supplements like glucosamine. Uh, I'm not sure about acupuncture. I don't do it. Um, I don't know, really know the evidence, uh, but glucosamine, I get asked probably once or twice a week from patients, should I be taking supplements? Glucosamine, chondroitin, they bring in the packet and say, 
is this okay? What I say to them, I say, look, there's no evidence it works, it doesn't do any harm. I get a lot of patients who swear by it. Um, if they can afford it, because it's a lifelong thing, then, then why not? And then you've got these herbal remedies. So natural and herbal remedies, which, you know, again, limited ev evidence, but again, I get asked a lot um, by patients. So traw meal, turmeric, and arnica. These, these are natural, herbal, homeopathic, anti-inflammatories. I get asked a lot about, about that. I don't really know, you know, I, it's not something I'm trained in, you know, this, this science is I'm not sure. Um, then you have this thing called honey gar and alkaline water. So honey gar is apple cider vinegar mixed with honey. Apple cider vinegar is acidic. When you ingest it, it turns alkaline, makes the body more alkaline. Alkaline water um, is alkaline and makes the body more alkaline. So therefore less acidic and less inflammation in the body. I mean, a patient told me about Honeygar um, and he's got pretty nasty osteoarthritis in his ankle. He's taking it, he takes it every day and he's fine. And he swears by it. He knows if he doesn't take it for a few weeks, he gets a lot of symptoms. So make of that what you will. Uh, but I thought I'd mention that because I get asked a lot um, from patients about these alternative remedies. They don't like taking drugs. They don't like um, injections and don't want surgery. Which is fair enough. No. <clears throat> but the biggest thing, biggest thing I tell them, they need to exercise. What kind of exercise? They need to avoid impact twisting, turning activity. What does that mean? That's cycling, swimming, upper body weight seated, cross trainer. There's loads of things you can do. But there's some things I tell patients. You know, they, they shouldn't be playing tennis. They shouldn't be running. It depends on the degree of osteoarthritis. But... Um, I give them the choice. I say, look, it, it's about longevity for your joint, particularly your knee, and um, depends on how bad their osteoarthritis is. Aids and devices, knee brace. Uh, you see a lot of patients around the city walking in trainers because you know the business shoes uh, can be quite hard on the body, or hard on the knees, joints, commuting. And also, I do a bit of trekking. I use walking poles, uh, not because I've got any arthritis. It's because it's an accumulative effect over many, many, many years. And um, so I always advise patients, uh, you know, if they're going to go trekking and hiking, use trekking poles, walking poles, because it does take pressure off the joints. So what's the, non, uh, what's the pharmacological management? These are nice guidelines from 2008, which is a long time ago, and they're being redeveloped this year or next year. Start off with paracetamol, and then you add in topical anti-inflammatory, and also capsicane, which is this sort of chili powder. Um, what that does is, I think it just kills the nerves in the skin, but nobody really knows how it works. But they're the these are nice recommendations. Uh, if that doesn't work, then you substitute uh, the above with oral anti-inflammatories, with proton pump inhibitor cover, and then you add in paracetamol if that doesn't work, and if all of the above doesn't work, then you consider an injection. That's sort of what I do as well. That's a sensible, sensible management. Um, so coming on to injections, uh, steroid is it's been around for a long time. Works really well. It's brilliant for controlling swelling, and is also um, good for symptom relief. And it, it it's a quick fix and it wears off, but it does allow rehabilitation. So I always tell patients, we can inject you, but you've got you to do the rehab, because you're not gonna get better if you just keep injecting you. You can't keep injecting you, because steroid will weaken articular cartilage uh, and the soft tissues. Um, I always say after a steroid injection, just rest for a five day period. It's gonna take the full effect between two and six weeks to work, and then you gradually load. After five days, you can gradually get back into uh, various forms of exercise and start the rehabilitation process. Uh, then we come on to other kinds of injections. So steroid is sort of, everyone knows about steroid. And then we have a visco supplement, hyaluronic acid, which I inject a lot. And my 
steroid injection rate has decreased a lot because I use a lot of visco supplements. Um, so what, is, what does it do? It sort of, I, I explain to patients like a lubricant for the knee, gets absorbed into our particular cartilage, uh, into the ground substance, brings water with it, stiffens up the cartilage so that it's not as soft and not as friable. Um, there's no limit to the amount you can inject, and, but typically I would inject once a year. Patients know when, when it's wearing off. Uh, and they come back and they go, well, that's time I need another injection. I get similar effects to steroid for mild and moderate osteoarthritis. The picture, does this work? No. Oh. The picture on the top, this is an ankle, it's not a knee. It's an MRI scan of an ankle, but this is a professional rugby player that I've been managing for many years. The picture at the top, you have the tibia and uh, the talus. And there's a big divot in the talus. You see the divot. Uh, 18 months later, he had a repeat MRI scan uh, for a different reason. And you can see that the divot is largely filled in. And what's happened in between? He's had four visco supplement injections, continuing to train at a high level, continuing to play. Uh, this is quite a dramatic example, which is why I put this up. But I see this kind of thing all the time. Um, for, for mild and moderate um, osteoarthritis, but with articular damage. Um, so I'm, I, I definitely know it, it, it works. And then you come into the slightly more, uh, less well-known, up-and-coming uh, type of treatments, orthobiologics. So PRP, platelet-rich plasma. I inject a lot of this mainly for tendons, but I've started to use it in osteoarthritis, having some good results. What is PRP? It's in the patient's own blood, only about 15 mils, when you spin it, and it separates into the yellow and the red bit. Uh, and also there's a, a middle layer. So the yellow bit's called plasma, the middle layer is platelets, and then that gets injected into various uh, tendons or, or joints. Um, if you look at the basic science behind this, it's quite compelling. Uh, the platelets secrete all these growth factors, and they also secrete hyaluronic acid, so like the visco supplement. And all, there was a theory that it promotes cell growth. The problem with PRP is that there's a lot of different preparations out there. So there's no one standardized way to do it. Um, so that, that makes the research difficult. And then you have mixed results in the literature. Uh, I've been using it for arthritis for about a year, getting some good results in mild, moderate osteoarthritis. I wouldn't use it for sort of end stage or severe osteoarthritis particularly when they have alignment change. But I'm getting some good results with that, similar to hyaluronic acid. And then lastly, last slide, orthobiologics is stem cells. And I get asked a lot, of, probably once or twice a week about stem cells patients. Um, again, the theory is very good. Um, the holy grail in articular cartilage is growing back cartilage. How do you grow back cartilage? Stem cells. Um, it's an undifferentiated, undifferentiated cell, can differentiate, differentiate into any tissue. So in theory, it can differentiate into cartilage. So how do you stimulate the stem cell to differentiate into cartilage? It gets processed, concentrated, and injected into a joint. You can harvest it from bone marrow or fat. Um, I think it's the future, but not yet. It's very expensive. It's not covered by insurance. Limited research, but um, the theory is good. And I think that's it. Thanks very much. Hi there, guys. I'm Mike Ornger from Technique Physiotherapy. And uh, today I'm presenting with Giles Leeming from Ossie UK. And we're talking about unicompartmental osteoarthritis and the uh, and the role of physiotherapy embracing. So often patients come to us as physiotherapists and um, you know there is definitely a role for physio in osteoarthritis as Carl's just mentioned way before they're getting towards the need for surgery. Patients often are getting a difficult diagnosis. The, the cohort of people that come to me in London are often young active people and for whatever reason, they've worn out their knee very early in the life cycle. Um, there's obviously a number of reasons for that, which Ian discussed earlier. 
Um, but but as, as such, they're, they're going to have to make some adjustments to their, to their lifestyles. And that's where physiotherapy, I think, has one of the key supporting roles. Cal mentioned we get to have contact with patients a lot more often. And because that, we get to know them. We get to know their, their tendencies as people. And we can make some really positive changes in their behavior. So I think it's really important to get to know the person, understand their lifestyle factors, and then really get into the education, help them understand why what they're, well, understand their current behaviors, why they are making their need worse over time. Um, then we can go into exercise prescription for physiotherapists. It's strength versus aerobic exercise. We tend to find people tend to fall in one or the other when they come to see us. Um, a lot of the time they're doing a lot of strength work, but they're not doing lots of aerobic and, or, or it might be the other way around. And I think in reality, the best approach is more of a blended approach. So it's just trying to encourage people to kind of not go too heavy on the weights, move back from that, maybe get into some low impact CV and then go from there. Pain control is a big part of it. Cal touched base with the um, pharma pharmacological side of things, but there are things we can do as physiotherapists, as you all know, in terms of getting people to do various things that are going to help their pain. And that may be things like appropriate exercise regimes. As I was discussing before, if they're doing too much strength work, it's, it's backtracking away from the heavy loading and, getting, and getting, um, getting more appropriate exercises in there. Optimizing joint function. Uh, with osteoarthritis, people often have um, a lot of a loss of range of motion. If we can optimize that with manual therapy, soft tissue techniques, it can improve their pain levels. Load management, it's about changing their behaviors, helping them understand that lots of impact isn't always good. So making adaptations to their long-term training programs. And then bracing, I found is very important at helping offload a break, offload the knee. And in particular with unicompartmental osteoarthritis, that's probably its strongest factor. It's gonna help take some pressure off one side of the knee, allow them to be more active and, and get the benefits of exercise. So essentially we're intervening that in that osteoarthritis spiral that Ian and Cal have both touched on. As people um, learn of their diagnosis, osteoarthritis, they become quite fearful of doing more harm. They might become less active. Um, and essentially that can lead them to be at risk of more comor comorbidities such as obesity. And that's essentially going to place more load on the joint. Uh, and a, a Cochrane review, review highlighted that face-to-face -face contact with a physiotherapist or health professional over a period of time helps improve pain and improvements in pa patients' overall function. So. How do we implement strength exercises? If they're not doing strength, it might be the, the flip side of what we were talking about. It might be someone who's not very active. How do we get someone strengthening? So what are we trying to do? We're trying to build strength in the key supporting muscle groups, the quadriceps and the hamstrings. Obviously there's other muscle groups to consider, but um, the research really supports looking at the quadriceps as a muscle group. Um, osteoarthritis, even in patients without lots of pain, there's quite a lot of evidence to say the quadriceps just weakens atrophies. So looking at how ways to strengthen those muscles is very important. Um, and again, there's documented evidence to say that patients that undergo resistance programs or formal resistance programs over a number of weeks to months have significant benefits in pain and function. Um, the stage of the OA, as Cal mentioned before, is very important in terms of how we go about um, how often we train the patient and how, how they actually do the exercise. Mild OA, they can do slightly more. Um, they might do 40% of their estimated one repetition max. Um, and they might work at a re around 3 to 12 to 15 repetitions. The frequency could be around 2 to 3 times a week. Um, the rest is key. So in terms of... Um, in terms of rest, they want a minimum of 24 hours in mild OA. Um, and it's important to have resolution of their pain or a, a real reduction in their symptoms before they start the next bout of uh, strengthening. Again, it's got to be important. It's important that patients do it within their current limits of functional range. 
and also within the limits of pain, they can still get a good strengthening effect without going into full range of motion. And that's quite important. Um, moderate to severe OA, it's essentially the same, but they're just downgrading a little bit. It's more like 30% of one repetition max, three, to, uh, three times 10 to 12 reps, and it might only be twice a week. And there's always at least 48 hours before they recommence the next set of strengthening. Again, within limits of pain and function. And then our last slide here on from the aerobic exercise point of view, from what I found, in reality, there's a, uh, there's a lot more variance in what people are doing in terms of aerobic exercise. The strength side of things is a lot more kind of well-structured research. The, the aerobic exercise, it's not clear what the best mode for improving patients' pain and function is. Um, walking and cycling have been very, um, very well evidenced as in improving uh, pain and function, um, but the research doesn't really go into uh, how how they actually do that in the studies. Um, essentially, low impact strategies of CV or cardiovascular exercise is much more sensible, um, but it is important to maintain some level of main of of loading in the in the knee. So, yeah. Cal mentioned swimming earlier. I wouldn't necessarily just take people away from swimming, but I do think it would be an, a, a nice way to offload the knee. Um, sorry, take people away from loading the knee altogether because I think that by actually loading the knee and loading the cartilage, you're actually helping to main healthy cartilage. The optimal frequency, it again, is a bit undetermined, but it falls in line with the World Health Organization guidelines. <laughs> And that's somewhere around three to five aerobic sessions a week, 30 to 45 minutes in duration, and somewhere around 50 to 75% of heart rate reserve. Um, so I think physios do really have an important role um, in the long-term health and fitness goals of patients with osteoarthritis. Um, less overall loading is key, more cross-training, and uh, ensuring correct frequency of training with rest is important. Um, and on top of that, the aerobic exercises, as, as the guys uh, touched on earlier, it's really helping to reduce their comorbidities and improve their, their life for the long term. Uh, and lastly, I, I kind of always it is an informed choice of patients. Um, you know, if a if a young chap comes to me, 40 years old, and he wants to run a marathon this year, I'm not going to sort of just tell him he should. You know, he cannot run that marathon. It's that is his. You know, I think it's it's important to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Understanding the risks is important, but I don't necessarily want to stop young people, particularly with mild OA, just achieving their long health term uh, health goals. Thanks very much. That's my input today, and uh, Giles is now going to talk about the unloader brace. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the unloader in terms of how it works, um, the types of patients it can be useful for, and some of the outcomes that can be seen in the literature for using this type of technology. In terms of indications, what types of patients do you use these braces for? It's effectively any condition uh, requiring um, unicompartmental unloading. And this is from mild to moderate uh, osteoarthritis. When we originally developed it, we were very much aiming it at the, the milder end of, of osteoarthritis. But over the years, the research has actually shown that it is effective in all Kelvin Lawrence uh, scales um, of osteoarthritis. But these unicompartmental conditions can vary from things like uh, articular cartilage defects repair, avascular necrosis, um, tibial plateau fractures, and it can also be a very useful tool um, for uh, predicting outcomes from um, either high tibial osteotomies um, or unicompartmental knee replacements as well. Uh, and in terms of the goals for, for bracing, what are we trying to get out of it? And effectively, it, it's pain relief. We're wanting to make that patient more comfortable. We're wanting them to enable them to go back to the uh, types of activities that they want to do. Um, and also delay surgery. We've, Ian's talked very much about surgery and its role uh, for these patients, but um, it's often useful to be able to manage these patients and they can have surgery uh, potentially when, when it's the most appropriate time for them. And we're aiming to 
enhance their quality of life, get them to do uh, different activities and the things that perhaps the, the, the pain and discomfort has been preventing them, uh, and reduce their medication usage. Um, there's obviously lots of potential side effects to pharmacological agents, so it's important that we provide something that, that is an alternative to just managing that symptom. In terms of how the brace works, um, it's applying a three-point pressure system uh, to the knee. And effectively, what we're trying to do is not necessarily sort of create a, uh, recreate that, that gap between those two bones, but what we're trying to do is influence uh, the forces going through that knee away from that area that's potentially damaged by that osteoarthritis. So it's applying that three-point pressure. In this case, uh, in a medial compartment uh, issue, um, it's applying a valgus force. To in, in what a lot of cases is actually a varus knee. And this is a dynamic force, which I'll go on to explain in a little bit. And these, this approach is actually backed up uh, by the NICE guidelines. So this is the NICE guidelines uh, for, for osteoarthritis. And you can see that the patient starts off in the center, often going to their GP and they're getting education uh, and advice, uh, whether that be about uh, exercise modification or um, ways to manage their weight. Um, and they're then going into that secondary ring, which is the low level of, of pain medications, whether it's paracetamol uh, or topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like gels and I believe and that sort of thing. And then we last have that, that tertiary ring. So the section at the top is about the uh, pharmacological agents that, that you can use to, to combat that pain, to reduce that uh, the painful effects of, of the osteoarthritis. Uh, on the right hand side with the local heat and cold as already mentioned by, by Cal. Um, assistive devices which for me as an orthotist I thought was exactly uh, you know, means orthotics but that actually more means uh, Zimmer frames, walking sticks, that side of thing. So uh, it's not, not so much the orthosis side of things. Um, joint arthroplasty and then surgical alternatives. So this is very much where, where Ian comes into it. Um, and then the, the, the yellow section the, on, on the left-hand side. So this covers supports and braces, shock-absorbing ins insoles, TENS machines, um, and manual therapy as, as well. So it's really where um, biomechanical uh, interventions can come in. And the NICE guidelines actually say if there's a biomechanical cause um, for the osteoarthritis, it should be met with a biomechanical solution. And it's sometimes it's something that we don't always necessarily address. It's one of those things that, that, that we don't necessarily um, go for. It tends to be the, the top section, the pain uh, relief side of things that tends to be concentrated historically. Um, this is also backed up by the ORC guidelines as well. So you can see in, in the, the, the different categories that they, they use for osteoarthritis patients, um, they're very much biomechanical interventions form a part of that uh, in each of those groups. Um, in terms of different options and different braces that you can use uh, in different patient groups, patients don't always present uh, exactly the same when you, when you see them in clinic. So for unicompartmental unloading, um, predominantly uh, it's the, the unloader one, but there are different versions that you can use dependent on the type of pathology the patient has. So if, for example, um, the patient has um, some degree of ligament instability, is it often you, you do go on to develop osteoarthritis post uh, ACL, for example, there's a well-documented link with that. Then the rebound jewel is a good option to consider because it gives you a degree of ligamentous control combined with unloading. Uh, on the left hand side we have the unloader light which is a more cosmetic version, potentially more suitable uh, for, for patients that are concerned with the cosmesis and, and they, uh, of using these braces with clothing and, and that type of thing. We also have things like the rebound cartilage and that's a little bit different in that it, it changes when and how uh, the unloading is actually generated. So in the case of a normal unloader um, that force kicks in, that unloading force kicks in from 20 degrees to full extension. With a rebound cartilage, it actually allows you to kick that uh, force in at a higher degree of flexion, so from about 45 degrees to full extension. And there's a variety of different studies um, that have actually looked uh, at the effectiveness and the use of these types of braces. So from a load reduction uh, perspective, uh, Polo et al. Uh, looked at a, a prospective cohort study of 11 participants, and they looked at the, the load reduction using 3D analysis, and they actually found that with bracing, um, it was actually possible to achieve a 17% uh, reduction in load. 
but actually found through um, through looking at the patient groups and their compliance with this using a DFS or dynamic four strap system as utilized in the unloader is a 14 uh, uh, sorry 15% uh, uh, load reduction but it's a very good balance between load reduction and also compliance as well so it's found to be the best compromise uh, for those um, and also looking at comparing different interventions. So um, Kirkley et al. looked at uh, comparing both against a sleeve and then a control group. And they found that the unloader was uh, effective treatment for both pain reduction, uh, function improvements, and also quality of life improvements uh, as well. From a, a pain and function point of view, um, Briggs et al. Uh, looked at a prospective cohort study of, of 39 patients and actually found significant um, uh, improvements in both pain reductions when looking at WOMAC scores. So it's effectively a whole of, uh, whole of life score of the effect of the osteoarthritis. Also improvements in physical health um, and quality of life improvements as well. And then finally, uh, a study that was uh, done in the UK by Professor Lee and his team, um, and they were looking at cost effectiveness. And this is an eight year study um, using 63 uh, patients. And they actually found that the use of an, uh, an unloader was, um, gave a similar quality gain when compared to a, a total knee replacement at eight year follow up. And this was well within the guidelines given by NICE um, for, for pound per quality. So it is a, a, a cost effective means of, of managing these patients that in some situations are on long waiting lists, uh, potentially for surgery within the NHS. Um, just a little bit of talk about um, sort of how patients do get these braces. So for you as clinicians, um, you obviously can, can, can order these and then fit them in your clinics. But also we have a variety of clinics throughout the UK. So we have clinical partners such as Mike um, who are fitting these braces. Um, so it, you can either fit them as part of your normal clinical workload, which we can help you with, um, or if, if you, you would prefer that it go to, to a, a, one of the clinics that we have links with, we can also do that as well. So it means we can manage these patients in the way that, you, that suits you best for your practice. Um, so what I'm gonna do now um, is a, a bit of a brace fitting. Um, Mike looks a little bit different than he did before um, because I'm gonna fit a brace onto Mike. And then what we're gonna do is he's just gonna briefly uh, go through uh, some of the, some of the uh, sort of features um, and some of the movements that are possible uh, with these types of braces. So, from a, from a sizing perspective and the use of these braces, um, the brace is actually sized according to a circumferential measure, um, 15 centimeters below mid patella. So I'm starting with a, with a straight leg, palpating the patella, and we're coming down 15 centimeters from there. And we then take a circumferential measure to give us our size. So there's a, um, a variety, a big range of sizes of off the shelf uh, braces. We also have custom options dependent on what the patient needs. So if you have a patient who's an unusual size or shape um, or um, an unusual alignment, for example, we can actually make custom made options to make sure that you get the best possible fit for that patient. So first of all, uh, I've undone the brace um, and you can see we have the dynamic four straps either side here like that. And I'm placing it onto the leg um, and making sure that we've got the hinge level with the kneecap halfway between the front and the back of the knee. Um, so what we're doing first of all is making sure that the patient is, is, is happy uh, and got this in the correct position. There's always a tendency uh, for people to, to fit it a little bit low. So we're lining this up level with the kneecap and halfway between the front and the back of the knee like that. Start with the bottom strap, a um, little difficult for you to see from the camera, but there's a, a blue buckle here, and equally there's a, a blue buckle here as well, uh, a blue marker here. And we're placing this over the top, making sure that we're on a little shelf on, on that side, and then we're clipping this into position here like that. And what I then need to do, which is difficult to show you from this camera, um, is just to actually tighten this calf strap at the back, okay? Um, and what we're then doing, now if you bend the knee for me, um, is we're placing the, the yellow version, the yellow buckle into position. You see this one here, flipping it into position and then tightening this one. Now this is a, 
somewhat simplified uh, way of uh, fastening this, but if I can get Mike to stand up and then turn around for me. And then what I'm gonna do is just adjust these straps either side. So what I'm wanting to do is remove uh, any of the slack from the system there like that. And you can see that it's very easy to actually use these uh, alligator Velcro sections here. And we just place these into position. Now, if you notice, um, I'm shifting these back out the way um, to make sure that we haven't got excessive bulk um, in behind the popliteal region. So it's really important that we haven't got significant overlap of these uh, extra sections of Velcro across the back here. And we'll go on to trim these uh, later. Okay, I'm just detaching the popliteal pad here and just tightening this one up as we go, bringing that across and then tightening it at the top as before. And at this stage, we're not applying any unloading force. We're just tightening these straps to remove any of the slack from there. Okay, if you have a seat again, please, Mike. Okay, and we can then tighten the smart dosing section in order to get the correct tension either side. So with these dynamic force straps, um, ideally, um, we want it to be set at five. So we're gonna straighten the leg and just check the, the tension of the straps. I'm just gonna tighten that one up a touch and that one a touch. And with any, with strap tension, it's important that we consider um, the patient, um, both in terms of their skin condition, but also their muscle bulk as well. So we, we would perhaps have the straps a little tighter in a healthy young individual such as Mike. However, um, we would uh, change that a little if the patient had uh, sort of more poor skin conditions. So you can control this very, very quickly and easily. Now, these smart dosing sections are, are really a tool for the patient to utilize to influence their, their pain relief. So they can actually increase or decrease the therapeutic effect um, of the brace to increase um, the unloading, or indeed, if they've got any volumatic changes, they can actually reduce that um, to accommodate um, any swelling that they may have. So it very much empowers the patient to control their, their pain levels in a similar fashion to how they would uh, with, with pain medication and that sort of thing. Okay, now the way the brace works is if you straighten the leg uh, fully there, Mike, the tension increases in these straps as we go to full extension. Now this is in line with where the osteoarthritis is uh, anatomically within the joint. So that normally affects the last 20 degrees uh, to full extension. So as we flex, you can see that the tension reduces uh, on those DFS straps either side. And the benefit of this is it means for patients when they're, when they're sat at uh, a desk or sat in a chair, for example, the articular surface that's affected by the osteoarthritis is naturally in contact. So you're not getting an unremitting force uh, in order to unload this. OK, so can I get to stand up for me, please, Mike? And you can see as he stands, um, we're getting a three point uh, pressure with a, a laterally directed force either side from the two shells, and then a medially directed force uh, from, the, from the DFS straps, the dynamic force straps either side, okay? Now with using uh, a brace like this, what we're actually wanting to do is, is facilitate um, both the patient to return, uh, return to activity, but also for them to, to participate in the, in the rehab um, and, and your, your sort of physio activities. So I'm gonna pass on to Mike uh, for him to, to, to cover that. So I think the first, when patients first, first have these braces on, what they often say is it feels like the brace is working against them. Uh, and I kind of reinforce that that's a good thing. That's one way that the, um, the brace is imparting its force on their legs. So that's how it's actually helping to offload the knee. And it feels quite alien to them at first. Um, because obviously they're, they're not used to something working against their legs, um, but it is part of the braces mechanism. And as you can see, as I extend my leg, the straps are tensioning. And what I'm feeling is the, the, the straps on the outside of the knee here are just helping to sort of impart a force on, that out, on the lateral side of my leg. And essentially this is a medial unloader, so it's helping to unload the, the medial aspect of the knee. A bit like if we were doing a, a valgus test on the on the MCL, basically. And um, um, in terms of exercises, what I was going to show you guys today was really that the brace is a functional brace, so it's not going to stop me doing things. So 
you can see that I can still do a, a squat to a chair quite comfortably. It's not going to actually impact any of those activities. Obviously, I'm only going to 90 degrees, but often patients come in and they'll ask me if they can do squats down a bit lower. In reality, the brace isn't actually kicking in as they go into flexion. It's not really doing its job. It's only in the terminal phase of extension. So, you know, if they want to do that, it's, it's part, if it's part of what they want to do in an exercise regime, that's fine, but it's not always necessary in terms of the osteoarthritis. Um, other, other exercises they could be doing, and, and you can see here that I can do sort of a, a split squat or a, a lunge, and it's not really going to impact anything on that. Uh, and as I do that, I can just feel again at the end of uh, the terminal phase of extension, it's just doing its job. It's kicking in to, to help offload the knee. For me, the, the brace is a good way to help relieve pain for patients doing exercise and strength, um, strength programs. And it's just going gonna, gonna to reinforce what we've talked about earlier today, that exercise, aerobic and strength training is very important in their long-term health and prolonging the, not only their own health, but the, the health of their joints. Uh, in terms of, I think there was a clicker, wasn't there? But in terms of the exercises, I'm not going to profess to tell you all the different exercises you want to do with patients. That's your role as physiotherapist. But there is good, good evidence to say that leg press or seated leg press is a, an important part of a rehab program. Again, within those loading guidelines I set out earlier, um, leg extension and leg curls are important. but these aren't necessarily functional exercises, but they are focused on strength. Functional exercises alone are going to be important. They're going to help load the knee as we were talking about. Um, in conjunction with an unloader, it's just going to help give them some pain relief whilst they're doing it. Um, and in terms of range of motion, as I was saying before, it's not really important to go into full range. It's really a case of doing the activities at the appropriate load that's going to give people a, a strengthening effect and, um, and, and also a, uh, an improvement in functioning. Um, and that's really how I utilize the, the brace and, and myself and Ian have set up this pathway over the last sort of um, two to three years now. And, and we, we've fitted a lot of patients with these braces and the outcomes are very encouraging and it seems to be having a positive effect on on patients lives so, okay thank you very much mike um so that that really can sort of concludes uh this evening are there any any questions both from uh the webinar uh people or in, inside the room um cal and uh, ian are still here so we can answer any questions if required um, you can also email um, ukevents at um, if there are any sort of questions after that. Um, if there are any uh, others outstanding, what we'll do is contact you afterwards. But just remains really to, to thank uh, both uh, Mr. McDermott uh, and, and Cal as well. Um, just, to, just to say thank you uh, for this evening. Also Mike um, and the team uh, at HCA and London Sports Orthopaedics. Um, just to say thank you uh, for coming this evening. Um, what we wanted to do is just, just end uh, on a view uh, of where exactly we are. Um, so we're right in the centre of London here at the moment. So what I'm just going to do is pass over uh, to my colleague who's got a camera outside. And you can see that we're actually right on the Thames. Um, so thank you very much for coming tonight. We'll leave that at live feed uh, out onto the Thames going for a little while. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We will send out that questionnaire and we would really appreciate it if you give that feedback. Um, thank you for joining us.